segment of this hour. We welcome in the State Director for Americans for Prosperity, Jason Huffman. Jason, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. How y'all doing? Good, man. How's the air quality in your part of the state? Because up here it's unhealthy. Uh, I think it's uh, about normal for Charleston. I mean, it seems which it is seems unhealthy. Right <laughs> which is yeah, it's normal for Charleston doesn't mean it's good, does it? <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I think it's probably a normal day. I haven't really looked. Those uh, ca- Canadian often. wildfires, the smoke has worked its way into the eastern panhandle now. So we, last I looked, our air quality index was 176, which is considered unhealthy. Now, in New York yesterday, we were over 400 at one point. The air was orange. Yeah, I saw the uh, the time-lapse photo of New York, and it went from uh, rom-com skyline to, like, the dark night really quick. Yeah, man. Uh, so anyway, if you... Uh, don't have to go outside much today. I would suggest that you uh, don't limit your uh, your outdoor activities if you can here. Jason, let's talk about Senator Joe Manchin, who was uh, very pleased with his work in helping to get the debt ceiling uh, agreement uh, done and the Mountain Valley Pipeline as part of that, uh, which uh, many people in West Virginia are hailing as a good thing for the state. However, uh, you are calling him out on some things and not quite ready to let him take his victory lap. Why is that, sir? Well, Rob, do you remember in school when the teacher would split everybody up into different groups and you had to do class project? And there was always, without fail, the one kid who wouldn't really do any of the work but still expected the credit. That was Gilstrap, that's, that's, yeah. John Gilstrap, <laughs> my co <co-host. laughs> Well, that, that's Joe Manchin when it comes to the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Um, because here's the deal. Let's not forget, for two years... Joe Manchin was arguably the most powerful person in the free world because he was the deciding vote in the U.S. Senate. Um, So if he wanted to get actual permitting reform done so that we could build energy infrastructure in this country again, as opposed to, you know, this one-off deal for a single pipeline that they stuck into a must-pass bill, he he could have done that, but, but he didn't. And so I just take issue with the victory lap. I think that it's disingenuous. Um, Again, you know, what we're talking about is a deal that was cut between the Republican Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, um, and President Biden. And, and frankly, McCarthy came out on top and in a big way. Um, they, they reduced a, a lot of wasteful spending, um, I think, which was a directionally good step, uh, step toward progress. Obviously, a lot more that they need to do. But, you know, <laughs> I just think that when it comes to Joe Manchin's part in that, um, again, having having this this one off project and in the eleventh hour stuck in to this bill, um, it, that's not the permitting reform we need. They have a bill that would do that. It's HR one, the Low Cost Energy Act, and so that's what we're 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 talking to folks about that at the doorstep. We're talking to folks about that in communities across the state. In your op ed, you say if Senator Manchin was genuinely interested in fighting back, he'd at least try to cobble together enough votes to pass Speaker McCarthy's Lower Energy Costs Act. If Manchin wanted comprehensive permitting reform, he'd have included the, it in the bill he co authored with President Biden last year, the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. Uh, as Appalachian granddaddies have aptly said, for eons, the proof is in the pudding. Senator Manchin's actions have not lived up to his tough talk. Uh, are you holding Senator Manchin to a level of responsibility that might be unreasonable considering the position that he's in? I mean, if you get elected to the U.S. Senate, that's uh, a, a pretty big bill of sale for the people of West Virginia. Like You sold them on your, your capacity and ability to get things done for the state. And by and large, I think that um, Senator Manchin has been in the catbird seat in the U.S. Senate in, in the recent history. Um, you know, for those two years, he was the deciding vote. And what was his landmark accomplishment during that time? He, he essentially put politics over principle uh, and passed the Inflation Reduction Act. And what did that result in? You know, tens of billions in taxpayer funded handouts to the accountable green energy companies, tens of thousands of new IRS agents higher taxes, including a, a new tax on natural gas. And so um, <laughs> the Congressional Budget Office at the time said that, you know, even the title of that bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, was, you know, not exactly uh, aptly put because it would have little, if any, impact on inflation. So 
I just, again, think that we're in a situation where um, somebody has to speak truth to power when it comes to uh, this, this victory lap that Manchin is taking, um, especially when, you know, he's, he's flip-flopping all over the place on this Inflation Reduction Act. First, he said when it passed, you know, he thanked the president for signing the bill so quickly and said it was going to be this fantastic thing for the state. Uh, then I assume he got some polling back and saw that people didn't like it. So last March, he, he cried foul. He said that the Biden administration was subverting um, the law and, and not implementing it properly. Uh, and he even went so far as to say that, you know, he was he would vote to repeal his own bill. Uh, um, and then last week, follow me here, he resumed defending the Inflation Reduction Act. He said, you know, this is a piece of legislation that we're going to be benefiting from for a long time. Uh, and, and as I say in the piece, I think – you know, it's it's probably unclear even to the senator himself whether he's for or against the bill that he and President Biden sold the American people, the Inflation Reduction Act. And so um, we just want to see some consistency out of the senator. We want him to try a little bit harder um, and you know stop taking credit where credit isn't necessarily due and get some things actually done. There's legislation that's pending, and we're in an economic crisis in this country. And one of the ways you fix that is reliable, affordable energy. And there's legislation that would fix that right now. John? I'm, I'm not an apologist for Senator Manchin by, by any stretch of the imagination. But it seems to me that, you know, at least for the first time in God knows how many years, there was a glimmer of hope in the sense of compromise that I think the debt ceiling conversation should not actually have happened. There are a lot of things in there, but the, but the, the battle lines were drawn. And it seems to me that the Republicans came out the winner, as you said, that McCarthy came out on top of, of the negotiation. So with all that as the backdrop, what are your thoughts about Alex Mooney voting no uh, on, on the debt ceiling debate? Well, I mean, I think probably a pretty unrealistic move, right? The, like you said, the battle lines were drawn and we were in a situation where this was the deal that um, the president was willing to take. It was a pretty good deal. It took marginal steps in the right direction. And don't get me wrong, there's all kinds of funding reform, um, fundamental overhauls of how we budget as a country that need to be done. Uh, but at the end of the day, they clawed back a lot of the COVID money. Uh, they had some fundamental budget reductions. And so I think pretty good deal. I think if you would have turned that down uh, in the House, the Senate would have said, OK, we're going to go make our own deal. And it would have been Chuck Schumer and President Biden's deal. And that probably would have been a clean debt ceiling increase um, without any of the caveats that conservatives are touting as, as a victory right now. So, uh, you know, art of the possible uh, with that with regards to that, I think it was probably a, you know, a posturing vote for him, knowing that um, they probably had the votes to pass it anyway. But isn't it? Isn't it fair in an environment where nothing is being getting has been getting done to allow at least once around the track on a victory lap because compromise happened? We, we got the, the pipeline. We did claw back a lot of the covid money. Uh, we did get cuts in in uh, spending, not what anybody wanted, certainly. But is it I don't understand why you want to deny the victory lap when it. The process of getting there was ugly, but politics are always ugly. But the fact is things happen, and I don't understand why we want to uh, say no victory lap at all. Well, I, I'm not saying no victory lap for the people that actually accomplished the things that are good. Um, you know, our, our friends on the Hill, our federal affairs team, uh, they work very closely with members of Congress, and you know, they have a good finger on the pulse of what's happening in the Congress. And what they tell us is essentially that, you know, a lot of that, uh, the Mountain Valley Pipeline in particular, came from um, Congresswoman Carol Miller, uh, you know, other members of the Senate like Shelley Moore Capito. Uh, and I think, you know, for Manchin to jump in and sort of claim credit is, is again, disingenuous because he could have, if he wanted that done, done it two years ago. Uh, but because it's an election year or getting ready to be one, uh, he decides that he needs to maybe adjust his image a little bit, because let's face it, he's got the worst poll numbers that he's had in his entire political career. And so I, I think that what we're doing is we're just calling out um, the balls and strikes like we see them. 
Matt Harvey. Good morning, Jason. So should uh, Congresswoman Carroll and Senator Capito, should they be should they be crowing a little harder about the the success of getting the MVP hopefully completed soon? Uh, I think that they have had a tasteful amount of celebration about it. <laughs> <laughs> a tasteful amount. I like that. Does that satisfy uh, your it, question it there, Harvey? Deal. Yeah. What? what so, uh, Jason, up here in the panhandle, um, we don't have any part of the MVP coming through the, the counties up here. But can you tell our listeners up here what it means for the other parts of the state? Absolutely. And I, I was just getting to that. And by the way, uh, Matt Harvey, a big fan, big fan, of Mr. Harvey. It's a good thing you have him on, Rob. Yeah, I love Harvey. Um, <laughs> good, he's a good American. Um, anyway. Gil so, a problem, but Harvey's good for the show. <laughs> <laughs> what the pipeline means, essentially, um, is that, first of all, jobs, right? We're going to have folks that are going to be put into work, um, putting this pipeline in, finishing it. Um, getting that natural resource into the literal pipeline is going to create reliable, affordable energy for folks. It's going to help uh, lower, particularly in a time of high inflation, uh, particularly in a time uh, where energy costs are going up because, uh, again, there is a uh, sort of alarmist caucus within Congress that is forcing this, this artificial energy transition that consumers didn't ask for that they don't want, uh, and, and they're pushing this agenda with, uh, without regard for the financial pain that it will cause people. And what the pipeline will do will help to alleviate some of that, uh, projects like that. Uh, and that's why we want to see uh, over, overarching uh, permitting reform done um, that really think um, about all of the projects that could have gone on the XL pipeline, et cetera, um, that you know, provide – that reliable, affordable energy for folks. Um, that's that's what we want to see. This is a good step in the right direction. But again, it's it's only one project. Uh, we're we're not going to get to energy abundance in this country, not having to rely on potentially hostile foreign actors for our energy. Uh, if if we keep going down this road of um, a contrived sort of not market driven approach to energy. And uh, our guest on the program, State Director of Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia, Jason Huffman. Do you folks have any other questions on the editorial about Senator Manchin before I move on to another topic? John or Matt? I'd just like to add that the pipeline is currently anywhere from 90 to 95 percent completed. And, you know, once it's up and running, it will provide a lot of revenues to the local uh, governments as well, our county governments in mm -hmm. West Virginia. I want to talk about the legislative scorecard Americans for Prosperity does each year after the legislative session concludes. Jason, I, I uh, for whatever reason, I do not have a copy of it this year. I'm, I know you'll forward that to me uh, next chance you get. But let's talk about our members of the Eastern Panhandle delegation, if you have that handy, and tell me how they did. And before you get into individuals, tell me what your uh, scoring dynamic was like. Well, as, as always, um, we, we don't actually provide a letter grade for people because I like to departmentalize out uh, what issues that they stood strong on, but really just put their roll calls out there. Um, and as my standard spiel with this goes, it is not that long ago that votes in the West Virginia legislature were not recorded for anybody to see or have access to. And a guy by the name of John Overington, uh, when he was a delegate, a longtime delegate, basically while he was still uh, in the minority as a, as a Republican, when Democrats still had control of both chambers of the legislature, said that isn't right um, because some folks are, are misrepresenting their stances on some of these issues when they go back home. And so he fought to get that changed, and, and really in the, in the spirit of, uh, of Delegate Overington, um, we put the scorecard out every year so that folks um, can understand where their lawmakers stood on some of the most important issues of the session. And, and generally speaking, um, just make government more accountable and, and transparent. And so the, the things that we really focused on uh, in this particular scorecard, the tax cut, obviously the largest tax cut in West Virginia history, uh, that is, I think, the, the biggest highlight of the session, but not the only one. Um, that was a uh, you know monumental achievement, a good a good piece of progress that we think will continue to reduce rates into the future because there are triggers in that bill. 
um, which is now law that that will continue to put money back into the pockets of hardworking taxpayers. And so, um, as far as you know, VIPs in your neck of the woods, uh, I don't know. You all might have seen some of our some of our digital ads running right now, but big shout out to Majority Leader uh, Eric Householder, who was I think extremely extremely instrumental in making sure that taxpayers got the relief that they deserve. Because again, we've we've been talking about cutting taxes since I want to say maybe 2017, as far back as as then. And so there's been a lot of discussion about it. Um, there were a couple of missed opportunities, and I think we kind of looked at this session as um, a must-pass year for tax reform because um, a lot of states around us were beating us to the punch. Um, and we already had, uh, prior to this bill going into effect, the 17th highest top marginal rate in the country, starting at $60,000, 6.5% starting at $60,000. We had the 14th highest second top marginal rate in the country. Um, and it just was not sustainable from the standpoint of bringing people to the state. Uh, I think it was, it was pushing people away. And uh, we we know from the states that have passed, you know, transformational tax cuts, um, states that that don't levy an income tax at all grow at double the rate in terms of population the states that do. And so we want to get closer to that metric. And so that was uh, that was a huge win. The tax cut dance was fascinating because it seems to me like all along we wound up with the plan that uh, former finance chair and now leader householder proposed a couple of years ago, Jason, like you mentioned, it kind of started with these uh, phased in state income tax cuts that would have triggers that would ultimately, at some point in the future, should all the triggers be met, lead to a 0% income tax rate for all West Virginians. It took an awful lot of dancing over several years and was really very intense in this legislative session, uh, specifically between the Senate, the governor and the House as to eventually what was going to play out. But it seemed like Leader Householder was on to the right way to do it all along. Yeah, I mean, you know, major props to Senate President Craig Blair as well. He, uh, he I think, um, was able to mitigate some of the potentially personalities that were involved in the conversation and, and really just did a stellar job of, of stepping up to the plate for taxpayers and making sure that something got done. And so that was... That was a really important one. I think uh, another one that was really important uh, that was, I think, got less of the limelight, but uh, open enrollment for public schools. Uh, we passed a bill in 2019 that basically uh, the intent of that legislation was to allow kids to enroll in any public school that they wanted to if there was a seat for them. Um, and some of how that was implemented at the county level was not as free it was, it was less freedom-oriented than perhaps we wanted to see and, and was the intent of the legislature. So House Bill 2596 uh, basically redid that code section and was very explicit about the level of freedom that we want students to have when it comes to uh, residential assignment, and that's that they don't have any. Um, you can go to any public school you want to as long as there's a seat for you. Uh, the, the county school boards cannot deny you uh, transferring either in district or out of district um, to go to a public school you're choosing. Uh, and furthermore, they have to publicize uh, that folks can do this open enrollment. And so that is actually, that puts West Virginia, uh, we've been a, a leader on education across the country, um, starting with the, the passage of the Hope Scholarship, the, the first universal education savings account in the nation. Um, now, you know, there are eight or 10 states that have adopted pretty much the same policy as us on that front. And this is us stepping up again to, to essentially say that we are a leader when it comes to foundational education in the country. And uh, this, this bill is going to be, I think, really great for families who um, they, they like the traditional system, but maybe don't like the school that, that their zip code uh, it has assigned them to arbitrarily. And so they can now say, hey, I'd like to go to the school down the road, and they can do that without a bunch of red tape in their way. John Gilstrap. I, I want to go back to something you said a couple minutes ago where you quoted that states with no personal income tax grew at four times the rate of those that, that had income tax. 
Um, isn't that an awfully simple statement? Aren't there an awful lot of other uh, indicators? For example, Florida has a thing called Disney and a, a huge tourist business. Um, is it fair to to hang the growth, hang, hang the important that much importance on personal income tax on the growth of a state that has the challenges of West Virginia? Well, I mean, policy doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? So I think there is something to be said about time and place and a lot of the other um, regulatory structures that are in place, the policies that a state has. But on the whole, I mean, West Virginia is, is moving up the ranks in terms of how free its populace is, right? A lot of the education changes that we've made. Um, and, and really, I, I think there's a camp of folks that think that um, – the tax rate just doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't influence where people decide to move, and I think that's uh, particularly in a, a post-pandemic world where, you know, you see a lot of remote work. And, and for your all's neck of the woods, that is, I think, uh, a, a very impactful sort of uh, cultural shift that we're seeing. Um, I think the tax rate definitely plays into the decisions that people are making. You know, you say somebody wants to uh, move thirty or forty minutes across state lines to, to have a, a significantly lower income tax, uh, people, particularly in this economy, uh, are, are making those kind of decisions. And so it, you, you're right that it is, it is wrong to oversimplify, um, but you got to remember that um, it's not just states like Florida that don't have an income tax. Um, you have states like Tennessee. Uh, you have states like um, – I think it's Wyoming. Is that the one I'm thinking of? Yeah. So um, basically, yes, but we, we can't take that as the only measure through which we're trying to push um, an incentive for people to be in the state, right? And I think a lot of the education work, we've done a ton of work when it comes to health care in the state, um, allowing folks to practice up to the, the full scope in, uh, of their training, uh, particularly advanced practice registered nurses, physicians assistants, et cetera, um, that's lowering the cost of health care in the state. And so, you know, we're we're making a lot of very solid and prudent moves that that were necessary for many years, but but that we just hadn't quite got around to. And we've seen a rapid adoption of those kind of policies in in the past. Final question for Jason Uffman from Matt Harvey. Jason, uh, recently, Senator Stewart, who's also a candidate for West Virginia Attorney General, has made statements about expanding the pro prosecutorial role that the attorney general has in West Virginia. And he, he didn't give any specifics. Uh, currently, the West Virginia attorney general has very limited, if any, prosecutorial powers uh, for criminal cases. Will the AFP, does it have a position on that? Or will it have a position on that if it I, I think it's kind of to be determined, right? There, that's that's a whole can of worms in terms of changing a constitutional office and the way that it currently functions. Um, I mean, really, I see the role of the attorney general, particularly under under Patrick Morrissey, who's done a stellar job as attorney general, uh, fighting it back against federal overreach and and really taking those fights to the U.S. Supreme Court and winning on behalf of West Virginians and, and frankly, these big, large state coalitions. I see that as as a, a major functionality of the attorney general's office. You, you add um, prosecuting in there. I, I don't know if that adds or detracts from from the office uh, as as it's functioning right now. And so I, I know that there's been some opposition from particularly, I believe, um, some prosecutors and law enforcement that, that maybe feel like that would be. Uh, taking away some some local elements of, of how they're you know enforcing the law and so I I don't know I mean I, not being a lawyer and, and Matt I think you know where I where I stand largely when it comes to, to justice reform and that's we need to do more of it because our, our criminal justice system is not functioning the way that it ought to right now um, I, I don't know that that's one we'll have to take a look at. Jason, thanks so much for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Any final thoughts or words that you needed to get out, sir? No, I just uh, appreciate appreciate the opportunity to be on, and uh, good questions. Thank you, guys. Good to talk with you, Jason. Have a great day. Yeah, you too.